us up, brothers and sisters. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode called Plan B. Plan B is dealing with uh, the ongoing issue that you may have seen in the uh, previous 20 questions episode when we were uh, having Chris and Emma do some work on Sprocket. I hope you guys enjoyed that gorgeous sunrise this morning. Another one was on deck as you can see, but it's a little cool, a little crispy in the Chicolton this morning. It was minus 10 out there when I was walking the dogs earlier. It is warming up. It's only minus 7 now. We're going up to about 14 or 15 today. Typical Chicolton spring weather. Enjoying a doobie of some Sour Christian cookies and of course there's always another doobie on deck. So I have a selection of clips for you guys to enjoy for this, that, and the other thing and I'll see you shortly for an outro. Till then, enjoy the show and I'll see you. Hey, hey it's your friendly neighbor Chili Boo and Mrs. Chili Boo. We're in the puddle in Williams Lake at Lake City Ford. We're not here to pick up this new truck, but I do have a new Ford key to a certain new car. You want to see what it is? Do you know what it is? Oh, it's right over there. You guys are going to be surprised. Ready for this? We're talking new Ford key. Boom, there we go. We did the last time we was here with the Mustang. So this is the uh, Mustang GT. We're going to take this home now. How's it going, so? A little bit of an overview of the festival. Check this little guy out. Huh? Another 2017 Econo box, 10,000 kilometers on it. I like this. The turn signals on the mirrors. Super, super clean. Take a look at the interior. We're talking new car smell. Crazy new car. Rocking up A and B Hill. The puddle's over my shoulder here. Neat little car. It's a, it's an automatic. I have a preference for standards. It's got a uh, sport mode on it where you can put the gear shift in sport mode and there's a little plus and minus on the shifter that you can go through five different gears. Other than that, it's a six speed automatic, one point whatever liter, 1.6 liter, four cylinder, developing 123 horsepower. Power! 123 ponies though. That's usable power though, so we can rock and roll and rally the shit out of Fester. All right. Looking at his odometer, like I said, he's a 2017 with 10,078 kilometers on him now. So he's just broken in. Highly detailed, full tank of gas, all the amenities. Yeah. So the whole point of this becoming what it was, was because I had mentioned with Sprocket, man, that $1,800 vehicle paid for itself. It endured a deer strike last fall, ended up getting a new headlight and a new hood. The hood was sourced from the States, so that wasn't a cheap fix, but the insurance on that covered it. We just paid the deductible. Then earlier this year, Chili Boo is going to work. The Wolf Strike takes out the corner of the front uh, valance on the driver's side. And after taking to the body shop, going through the insurance company, the cost to fix that was worth more than literally the price of the car. So the insurance company got a hold of us and said, hey, we'll give you a $900 check and uh, you can get that fixed yourself, that's cool, but we're gonna uh, wash our hands of it. And we're like, Okay, it is what it is. We were actually going to get Chris to do some fiberglass work on it. And then, here we are, last week, several hundred meters from home, coming down the road. Car loses power, gears down, what's going on? Still losing power. 
literally the car died at the front gate. You know where our front gate is? The car died there, would not turn over. We pushed it in to where you saw it in the video for Chris and Emma. We're working on it. New timing belt did not rectify the situation. The, uh, whenever it went, because it was more than likely the timing, jumped, threw off the timing, valves, lifters, internals, clickety-clack. When the new belt was put on, the car was turned over. You had that discerning sound as if someone threw some change in your engine. Not good. So, $1,800 car has more than paid for itself. It's moved a ton of shit. It's had so many trips to and from town. It saved our asses when we uh, purchased it in March of last year. It was only March, a year ago. We did put a, we did put about, I don't know, 60, 70 K on it. All highway, like I said, we've moved stuff in it. It's gone down to the lower mainland. It's done trips. It brought back dresser, supplies. We moved Dell and Karen's small freezer from their house up here over to our house when they let us borrow their freezer. Yeah, so we may try to sell it for 500, 600 bucks, letting people know that it has an engine issue. Someone may be able to invest their time and a thousand bucks in it and have a reliable little Econa box, but we're not at that point in time where we can do that. And as soon as the sprocket went, Yeti got called into full-time duty, so gas prices in BC are ridiculous if you don't know. They're ridiculous. And putting kilometers on him, even though he's going back and forth, you know, not doing anything, just putting kilometers on him. The idea was in a year or two with Yeti, bring him to Ford, low kilometers, trade him in on something a little bit newer. Luckily with Fester here, he comes with a three year warranty just covering everything. So preventative maintenance will be done. He'll be rallying back and forth literally from Alexis Creek to where we live. And then he'll make the occasional trips into town for shopping and that. Yet he'll stay parked, except for when we need to use him to do grain runs, like today when he comes home. He's gonna have some hog grower in him. The occasional dump run, maybe some firewood hauls, and the occasional trip to the mailbox. Pretty cheap. I gotta say, financing is pretty cheap for this little guy. He's pretty neat. He's got lots of bells and whistles on him. I've got to go through the manual. There's different things that uh, entail what he can and cannot do. But uh, yeah, we were impressed when we found him. They've got a great used inventory selection there. So uh, yeah, when it's time, I think we will go back there. That's a great customer service with those guys. All right, got a long ride home. We're not even to. Sheep's Creek, yeah. Spin the old camera around. Like a, take a peekaboo. Want to take a few minutes and uh, talk about uh, ignorance. In this particular ignorance has been expressed by a member of my own family, so to speak. My brother-in-law, nice enough fella, smart enough fella, to a degree. She was, uh, or she being, Mrs. Chilibu was down there, this is the 60s zone now. Mrs. Chilibu was down there visiting the in-laws and doing stuff and she was over at uh, her sister's and her brother-in-law's place. So they get into a conversation about legalization of cannabis. It seems that my brother-in-law has been erroneously educated to the fact that in his mind he believes that the government and all the scientists associated with the government they're all bang on as to what they're saying about cannabis and how dangerous it is and how they should grow it and how they should control restrict it. Control, restrict, and regulate it. He's even 
absentmindedly enough said, and this is someone that doesn't enjoy cannabis, they're not using cannabis, that you know the scientists and the government know what they're doing with the sprays and the pesticides and it's good for the plants. But obviously not being someone who's ever cultivated cannabis, you know, the, the whole caveat of spraying pesticides and shit on flowering and dried cannabis escapes him. He's also of the mindset that uh, those that basically are the grassroots mom and pops, the, uh, the home growers, the cultivators across Canada that for decades have been doing their thing, well, they don't know anything. He was even obtuse enough to tell my better half that I, your friendly neighborhood Chilibu, should get into selling cannabis for the government. Mrs. Chilibu's uh, uh, reaction to that was almost laughable, and she said, he'll never be a sellout, and he would rather give his cannabis away to those in need than to have anything to do with that system, which is true. As a matter of fact, like, that is what it is. So he is also of the mindset um, that there's nothing wrong with processed foods, organic stuff is just garbage, it's all hype and overblown. And this is a fella that, uh, like I said, he's got some smarts. He's, uh, you know, he's had some success in online business strategies and, you know, he, he's one of those guys who gives himself a pat on the back because he thinks he's all that in a bag of chips. I remember sitting beside him on a school bus leaving the 2012 Tough Mudder where we'd gone down to compete and he was there to see his stepson who was also competing and enjoying the day and then all the uh, participants in the event were bus from uh, Whistler Olympic Village where it was held back to the campgrounds so he sat beside me in a business suit telling me how great he is how successful he is how much of a change he's making to his lifestyle and he's getting healthy Mind you, this is seven years ago, and evidently, he was letting my better half know during this conversation debate that they were having that he's got a, a recumbent bike in the living room, which they do, and that he's going to the gym, and he's doing this, and he's doing that. But the truth of the matter is, he wakes up, he sits in his lazy chair, he eats garbage processed food, he watches television, spends his time online, and does little to no physical exercise but he's an expert and he knows he says he's gonna do a lot of stuff again I'm giving you the uh, sort of uh, example of the fact that seven years ago okay, this guy's been an empty can making a lot of noise for a long time especially when it comes to health and wellness specifically then uh, Another dear longtime friend of mine had a conversation with one of his brothers. Very intelligent guy, once again, very politically minded. Once upon a time, uh, this guy had worked for the Republican Party. He's a Canadian, good uh, political mind, so to speak. So he was hired by uh, the Republican Party several years ago, a decade ago, or whatever. But he's a, uh, a staunch conservative um, supporter up here in. Canada, eh? So my dear friend Kelly, who is he's really intelligent. There's there's no there's no doubting that. Very open-minded, very progressive with his thoughts and his thinking. He knows that whether you pick this flavor or that flavor in your, you know, whatever your political slant is, that you're just being manipulated. You're just a useful idiot being controlled by the man. So their conversation segues into legalization of cannabis, whereas his brother being a conservative um, supporter stated that the conservative government under uh, Harper would have done a better job at legalization than what uh, Trudeau and the liberal government has done. And my friend is just laughing at him, letting him know like it's half a dozen to one, six to the other. The itinerary that they put in, uh, put in place for the legalization of cannabis, it would have been manifested as it is, no matter who is in control. And I've seen this a lot um, in the last year or so when it comes to discussions with folks about legalization of cannabis and they are blaming Trudeau. Trudeau fucked it up and he did this. And ad nauseum tried to say, hey, 
That's not the point. The point is, this whole legalization scheme has been in the works for a long time. It doesn't matter which political flavor was the CEO of the country of, or the company of Canada, as it were, shit was gonna happen like it happened. It was gonna be a controlled, restricted, regulated, monopolized, <laughs> monopolized industry that corporations and their buddies were going to take over, which they did. So they go back and forth and they're having this discussion and Kelly's brother gets so worked up, so irate that he's like, oh, no, no, no. storms out of the room, conversation is over, debate is over. Man. They think nothing of it. Yeah, he got he got a little bent out of shape and fuck he didn't want to have a debate anymore. Good enough. The boys are up there for a snowboarding weekend. Alright. So they get up the next morning, bright eyed, bushy tail, get ready to go snowboarding. And the two brothers notice that the third brothers, well he's fucked off and gone snowboarding without him. I guess he was pissed off. So they get all their gear together and they're getting ready to go and they go and they realize something is amiss. And what is amiss is the fact that their brother's snowboarding stuff is not even there. He's not there. He's not snowboarding. After he unsuccessfully wanted to shove his point and not having it readily accepted and got mad and left the room, he went to his own room, packed his shit, took a bus from Whistler's Village down to Vancouver and jumped on a plane and was back in Alberta within a matter of a couple of hours. And I went, holy fuck, Kel. Your brother got so worked up, so agitated that he took his ball and went home. Isn't that an amazing example of how manipulative politics can be? how it just sort of works people up into a fever where they cannot emotionally separate themselves from the topic they're, they're discussing to, to point and counterpoint with one another and then have a, have a sort of dialogue where even if you don't agree with the other individual, at least you're open-minded enough to let them speak and not get so worked up. So a couple of examples I wanted to share with you. You know, I see this a lot. I've seen it in my own life business-wise, I've seen it personally, and you got two groups of people out there. You got all those folks that are like, man, 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 man. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna, I'm saying this, I'm gonna do this when I, well, when this happens, I'm gonna do this. Well, when I get this done, I'll do this. You've got those folks that are saying what they're going to do. And then you've got the other type of folks that they may say it once, but most often, if they've got something in their head, an idea, or, or they're gonna implement some change, or they're going to quote unquote do something, they just fucking do it. I've seen this in my own life, like I said, personally, with friends, family members, when I was in the personal training business, holy fuck did I see people jam up with their clam out about the most mundane things, mundane excuses, pro offer me excuse when you get to the gym why you can't work out so hard as my client. At the end of the day, like pretty much everything else, the choice is yours. You can sit on your ass, you can make a lot of noise about what you're gonna get around to doing, or you can get the fuck off your ass and just do it. <laughs> just going by Cheskut there and the Chacolp River, down on Cheskut, a few clicks, you're gonna come across the Marnet family farm. For those in the know, that where Godforsaken Customs lives off grid. Back in 2016, when they came out west with the better ridges, that's where we put them up. We put them all up there in that little cabin off grid near the river and gave them the, uh, the off grid outdoor experience. Just going by the abattoir, you saw that previously when we dropped off the pigs. The reason you're here is we're going to break and fester and I just uh, took this doobie out of the doob tube and holy shit does it stink. In a good way. This is a little bit of a Trinity 2.0, Pop G Grows genetics, and some Casey Brains genetics, sour cushion cookies. Alright, a little bit of salad, baby. A little bit of salad. Safety first. Wait till I get around this corner. A 
couple nice cars out here, especially if you're on a bike. All right. Let's see what happens when I open that a bit. Hopefully it's not too loud, but uh, yeah, I can't be hotboxing myself. So I just wanted to share this little, this little momentous toasting. Oh, faster with you guys. Road surface is changing. Yeah, back to the seal coat. We were on that blacktop for a long time, and who knows? Maybe uh, our taxpayer monies will pay for it to be paved all the way out to the fucking Pacific. Don't hold your breath. Sorry about the bumpiness of the ride, but hey, it is what it is. Oh, and then seal coated. Hey, there it goes in. That was a gopher. No, it was a groundhog. I saw him running down the side of the road on the other side. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Gotta love wildlife, man. Eh? Deers are out in abundance. Big time. Maybe you better watch your ass. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> guys just saw that last clip. I'd christened Fester as you saw. I enjoyed that christening. We were done. Not even 10 kilometers later <laughs> I come through a little snaky turn and I go by one of them fucking white RCMP SUV trucks. I'm doing a buck ten and a hundred pretty good with that they'll let you they'll let you have it sometimes they, they flash your lights when they go by it just to sort of scare the shit out of you and make you slow down but I saw him as gave him a wave and uh, I am less than 8k from home happy as hell about that <laughs> mountains are just shining for me we've got a couple of whoop de doos that you guys know about when you come through this area there's a little one here's a bit bigger one all right now we'll do the outro. <laughs> you have a work truck, you gotta be able to haul your feed, get supplies, go get firewood and all that. But again, at uh, between a buck fifty up to a buck seventy something the liter, holy shit, that can get expensive. And a trip to town in Yeti is seventy five bucks as it is. So happy to have Fester part of the stable. He's gonna rock and roll, and uh, we'll keep you updated on how fantastic a little vehicle he is. Anyways. Thanks again, as always, from the farm. We wish you peace, lots of love, lots of blood, lots of lots of blessings. Well, you know I was going to trip up somewhere, so there you go. Have a fantastic weekend, and we'll see you later.